pop in. No, let's do the Facebook thing before you even walk up there. Yeah, I already walked. Check. Sorry. Good evening. Can everybody hear me okay? All right. Awesome. Welcome to Steam Cafe for December. My name is Angela Mettler and I work for the President's Office at South Dakota Mines. Uh, we have been putting on Steam Cafe since April of 2018 and it's a partnership between South Dakota Mines, South Dakota Public Broadcasting, and Hay Camp Brewing. So thanks for coming and thanks to everybody who is attending uh, virtually as well. We could not keep doing this without you guys. Uh, so tonight, our presenter is Dr. Darren Claybo, who is the South Dakota State Fire Meteorologist and a research scientist at South Dakota Mines. And I'm very happy that he's here tonight. This is the third time we have had to schedule him. Uh, there was a very busy fire season this year, and he kept having to go and be on fires. And so he is about to talk about what he does when he is not on campus. Thank you, Angela. Uh, good evening again. My name is Darren Claybo, uh, State Fire Meteorologist for South Dakota. Um, thanks for coming. I, you know, this is the best presentation I'll ever give is at a brewery. I, I can't ask for anything more awesome than this. Um, so along with my duties as State Fire Meteorologist for South Dakota and as a research scientist uh, at the School of Mines, I'm also an incident meteorologist. And I'll kind of walk through what that means and, and what we actually do when I get assigned to wildfires. And so the first thing is when we get assigned to wildfires, as an incident meteorologist, I work as part of an incident management team. An incident management team is just a large organization um, that different governmental agencies can order in as a resource to manage complex incidents, incident, uh, incidences that uh, maybe go beyond the scope of what that local unit is trying to do. So for example, if we have another large fire in the Black Hills National Forest, if that large fire exceeds the capacity of the Black Hills National Forest, they will order in an incident management team, basically an overhead team um, to kind of oversee the operations for that wildfire. That allows the local unit, in this case, the Black Hills National Forest, to say focus on uh, other emerging incidents like other fires or other issues that they have on the, on the landscape. And so incident management teams are kind of big organizations. Um, this is just a, a chart that uh, kind of describes what an incident management team is. Uh, basically an incident management team is led by an incident commander. And these are uh, nationwide standards that go into organizing these teams. Um, the incident commander oversees everything. They're given a delegation of authority when we get to an assignment um, and they have legal authority to do whatever we need to do to, to manage that complex incident. Within the incident management team, there are a few different functional uh, groups. The four most notable groups are the operations section. The operations folks are the ones that actually do the work on the ground. For wildfires, this would be all of our wildland firefighters. Uh, for floods, it would be folks that are out building dikes or, or, or the actual boots on the ground. We also have a logistics section. Those are the folks that are gonna be set up to um, take care of food, take care of housing or tents or showers, making sure that everyone has uh, bathrooms that they can easily access, uh, making sure that there's water out in the field where it needs to be, ice, et cetera. They're the ones that basically run the town. There's also the finance section. Uh, the finance section is the one section you don't wanna piss off because you won't get paid. 
Uh, and then, of course, we have the planning section. Now, the planning section is a section that the incident meteorologist actually works in. And the planning section's uh, goal overall is to ensure that the plan for whatever incident we're working on is not only being created, but all the intelligence and everything else that goes into that plan is being collected as well. And so as an incident meteorologist, I actually work within what's called the situation unit, which is part of the planning section. The situation unit is literally just looking at the situation. How is the situation evolving? And so for wildland fires, it would be trying to collect information. Um, we have our GIS folks that work with us. Um, it's myself as the incident meteorologist. Uh, we also have a fire behavior analyst that works with, and I'll be talking a little bit more about our relationship uh, here on the next slide. Other sections that go with it, they're, they're not necessarily section chiefs, but we have a liaison officer, a public information officer, and a safety officer as well that answer directly to the incident commander. Safety officer is just in charge of making sure that everything is being done uh, as safely as possible. And the incident, meteor, uh, the incident management team that I work on, which is called the Rocky Mountain Blue Team, our medical unit is actually embedded with the safety officer. So anytime any medical emergencies were arrived, we would have that under the safety officer as well. Public information is pretty straightforward. Um, the public is hungry for information. So it's the PIO or the public information officer that um, basically are interfaces with the public. And then the last person is the liaison officer. The liaison officer is the one that's kind of in charge of building the relationships within the community. And so our liaison officers, they work with all the different cooperators and agency administrators, just ensuring that we have continuity throughout the entire uh, complex scenario that we're trying to manage. So in terms of incident uh, meteorology, I met, you'll hear me say I met quite a bit. That just means the incident meteorologist and the F band or the fire behavior analyst. Uh, we are besties for a lack of better terms on a wildfire. I never really leave the F band side except for when I'm sleeping or using the bathroom. Otherwise we're pretty much married the entire time. And so you have to have a good working relationship. And the reason why you need a good working relationship is because of this triangle that I have on the left. That's what we call our fire behavior triangle or fire environment triangle. It's the three things that dictate where, when, and why a fire is gonna to move to wherever it, it, it moves to. It's topography, fuels, and weather. I deal with the weather side of things. It's my job on the fire to forecast the conditions, the weather conditions for that fire, and to ensure that all the operational resources and the other functional groups have access to that information. The fire behavior analyst's job is to take my weather information put it in terms of the topography and the fuels that are on the ecosystem, and to basically speak that out into what could the fire do under these natural conditions. So I don't necessarily work for the fire behavior analyst, um, but I work underneath them in terms of I provide them with information that allows them to provide other information to the other resources that are on scene. Uh, we can fill in with our situation unit and make sure it gets up the chain of command. I jokingly call us the intelligence team. There are some folks that do call us the intelligence team, but you know, it's not always intelligence that goes with it. Uh, this is a guy, his name's David Greathouse. He's a, a fire behavior analyst out of North Carolina. And we were working the Beaver Creek fire together a few years back and we became very, very good friends. Not only because we spent a lot of time together, but he was just an incredible character and I'd never met anyone like him before. And so really one of the biggest things that I try to do when I get on wildfires is to establish relationships. And it's not only about establishing a relationship with the F band, but establishing relationships with all of the other people that you end up working with because it ends up being a lot, a lot of people. <laughs> Adam's back there smiling like, yep. He fights fire. He, he actually does work, so. So how do we get assigned as IMETs? Well, I'll take you through a scenario. My wife, Jenny's here, and she probably knows this. Um, it's, it, it can be kind of sudden. Uh, as a meteorologist, I have a general idea of where, when, and why the conditions are ripe for wildfires. I just don't know about that, that thing called ignitions that actually starts the fires. And so most of the time I'll have an idea that um, our incident management team is maybe up for an assignment. And maybe, let's say this summer, um, you know, northern Colorado in August was really starting to become hot, dry, windy. Fuels conditions were right for a fire. And so as a meteorologist, I'm always looking at satellite data. And so I tend to have an idea of when fires first start to pop. And as soon as a fire starts in the agency that we're working with, um, or that, that owns that fire, if you will, 
they will, if they need to call in an incident management team, they will go through that process to do so. Once that happens, they contact the incident commander. The incident commander contacts all their functional groups and it's basically an information tree. And we all get contacted through text or phone calls that's saying, hey, uh, we're getting an order for an assignment. And when I say an order, I literally mean a resource order. This is a resource order. Basically just tells me what's going on. I can't travel until I have this in hand. Once I have this in hand, I can be assigned to a wildfire. And if something were to happen to me while I was traveling to wild, the wildfire, I could be insured and covered and everything else. But this has all the pertinent information. This is my resource order for the Cameron Peak fire. I'm technically an overhead position. Um, they're ordering me as an incident meteorologist. I'm supposed to go to Walden. By the way, this was on August 14th when I was supposed to head to Walden. And um, I think on this one, I actually got the resource order the night before I had to leave. So I had a whole night to get ready, which was pretty cool. Uh, and so you get all your stuff ready and you have most of your stuff packed and, and you head on the road once you get your resource order. And on this fire, I was heading to Walden, Colorado. So I'd head you know, south out of Rapid. I went through um, you know, Maverick Junction and over Orange Junction. I was heading south, um, got to Laramie. And by the time I got to Laramie, I could really see this, this fire was building and it was building big time. You could see the huge smoke column going up. And we were recognizing very, very quickly that this was gonna be a, a, a major, major wildfire. And it turned out to be the largest wildfire in Colorado's history. In fact, there's still a type three incident management team assigned to it and it's December 15th, four months after the fire started. And so um, it, was a, it was a big incident and we were there, we were the first team on it. Um, and it was, a, it was a fun assignment. I learned a lot up there. So as an incident meteorologist, when I get to an assignment, I have to put on my meteorologist cap. And the first thing I really like to do when I put on my meteorologist cap is really assess what the topography looks like because the topography is gonna drive what the winds are like on the wildfire itself. And so I'm, I, I take a deep dive into really it's Google Earth. I fly through, I fly around, I try to see where the fire is burning, what kind of topography it's burning in, how that topography might alter, especially the wind speed and the wind direction. My forecast process when I'm on a fire is a four-step process. I gather data, I assess the data, I interpret the data, and then I have to communicate the data. So when I gather the data, that's just me being a meteorologist. The first two steps in here is what all meteorologists are trained to do, right? Look at data and assess that data. Try to figure out what the big problem of the day is going to be for that particular fire or that incident. It's not always a wildfire. Um, so, you know, I'll go through my forecast process and I'll, I'll kind of get the bigger picture of what's going on. From there, I have to interpret that information into the, into the different applications for each of the different functional groups on the fire. And then I got to figure out a good way of communicating it to those folks. So again, gathering the data and assessing the data, it's pretty straightforward meteorology. I think we're the one place that incident meteorologists differ from say a regular meteorologist is in the interpret and communicate part of the process. This map that I have on here, I don't know how well you guys can see it, but it's basically a bunch of wind arrow vectors across, we were doing a, this is from a prescribed fire down in Custer State Park. And um, you basically have to overlay what you think the wind's gonna do upon the topography. And then there are various computer programs, computational fluid dynamics programs that we can use that'll apply a wind vector to the terrain using different principles like conservation of mass, and it'll show how the flow will go through the terrain itself. And it's pretty neat technology to have, but it has limitations. And that goes back to why I just really prefer to look at topographic maps, because it'll really help me understand what the topography looks like, how the sun's gonna hit it, and what that actually is going to do to the wind. The wind is by, hard, by, hard, uh, by far the hardest thing to forecast on a wildfire, but it's definitely the thing that drives fire growth the most. The last step in the forecast process is communication. And communication is incredibly difficult. And I think all of us may have learned this, oh, since like the beginning of March, right? When we're trying to teach classes and communicate with students and trying to understand, you know, how we can convey what we're trying to see in a way that the student can understand. It's no different on a fire. There's six, in my opinion, there's six steps to communication or effectively communicating. One, knowledge of yourself. You have to understand your limitations, your drawbacks, or what things you are good at doing. Um, you know, if you're not a good public speaker, understand that about yourself and work on it. 
right? You also, you also have to have knowledge of your audience. You have to know who you're talking to. Different audiences are, are different. There's different expectations that comes with it, which actually brings me down to the fourth one. You have to have the knowledge of the expectation of the audience that has for you. What do they expect when they enter in the room? Obviously, you have to have knowledge of your topic. We train meteorologists. I hope that all incident meteorologists are trained, you know, within weather forecasting of itself. You have to have knowledge of your medium. And what I mean by that is how am I going to communicate? Am I communicating in person or am I communicating on a text? How many of you guys have ever lost context in a text? Like, oh, uh, yeah, that didn't go across how I thought it was going to go. Right, so you have to understand how you're communicating it in order for that point uh, to, to get across. When we're working on fires, we, we have in-person meetings, we have radio meetings, which is a two-way radio. Um, I talk on the phone all the time. Um, this year, we did a lot of Facebook Live. We're doing a Facebook Live now. Um, you know, texting, all these different things. You have to understand how you're gonna communicate. And then finally, you also need some kind of acknowledgement from your audience. You can talk all you want, but if the listener's not receiving your information in a, in a way that's understandable to them, you, you haven't communicated. And, and to me, that's the most important part of communicating weather information as a meteorologist. It's ensuring that the person that's out there comprehends what I'm saying in a way that's easily digestible to them. I can have the greatest forecast in the world, but if the people out there don't understand what I'm trying to say, that forecast is null and void and it's not going to matter. So what is the best mechanism for conveying the information? It depends on your audience. It really, really does depend on your audience. So when we're on a while on fire, this might be a little bit small for some of you to see, but this is our schedule. It's a, it's a long schedule. Um, basically, it, our, our first meeting starts really at 5.30 a.m., um, the last stuff needs to get in by, by 10 o'clock p.m. It, it gets to be a long day. But all of these yellow highlight, highlighted areas are different meetings that I have to go to each day. Um, so it's basically just a constant cycling of meetings. But every meeting has a different audience. And so even as a meteorologist, I might have a forecast in mind, but I have to convey that forecast differently depending on the different user groups that are out there because it definitely varies. Um, how many of you guys have ever been frustrated by a TV weather forecast because they didn't provide the information you wanted? Yeah, it can be frustrating, right? And so what I try to do as an incident meteorologist is I try to tailor the specific words that I'm saying to the audience that I'm in front of. So this is the paper fire weather forecast that I produce. And this is from the Cameron Peak wildfire. On the left-hand column, it doesn't matter what it says. On the left-hand column is my fire uh, weather forecast. On the right-hand column is the fire behavior forecast. So basically, this goes into what's called an incident action plan, which is our entire plan of the day. Our incident action plan contains our incident objectives, all the pertinent contact info, forecast, safety information, um, communications, radio communications, all the channels, what all the different parts of the fire are gonna be doing, what resources are assigned to what fire. And so this all gets put into an incident action plan. And my forecast goes in there as well. But in my opinion, the written forecast is the absolute worst way I can convey weather information to a firefighter, right? This is just one piece of information that a firefighter has. And everybody on the fire gets an incident action plan. I shouldn't say everybody, all the leadership on a fire gets an incident action plan. So if you have a fire engine with three people on it, the engine boss would get an incident action plan. A uh, hand crew, the, the hand crew soup would get an incident action plan. And so that's only one way that I can communicate weather information to everybody that's out there. But remember this idea that there are several different audiences that I'm conveying information to. One of the audiences is the whole entire incident management team, right? We have all these different functional groups. Well, do you suppose that it's important to have logistics know what the weather is going to be doing? If logistics is the one going to be setting up tents for caterers, shower units, porta potties, delivering water, et cetera. Yeah, it's very important. But the things that are important to them aren't necessarily going to be important to maybe our operational resources. So our operational resources are the boots on the ground, people in yellow shirts that are actually fighting fire. 
right? I can look at a topographic map on the tailgate of a truck like we were doing here. This is a fire carpenter road wildfire up in northeastern Washington. Uh, we spent three weeks up there, something like that. Very complex fire. Um, but yeah, I go out into the field as a meteorologist. I sit down with our operational resources and, and literally look at a topographic map and say, hey, this is what I think is going to be going on. And they tailor their operational goals to basically what the weather is going to be doing. Where is it going to be favorable to do maybe a burnout operation? Where is it favorable um, to do something else? Where can we save houses? Where can we make gains? And that's all gonna be based upon fuels, topography, and weather. Weather is the one that varies the most. Um, cooperators and agency administrators, AAs, they're another different user group. So our cooperators, again, are all those people that are kind of tangentially related to the fire. So that would be all of our LEOs, our law enforcement officers, maybe our power companies, um, local emergency management folks, uh, gas, all the infrastructure, DOT, all of those folks would be cooperators, right? They all have a stake in the fire as well. And so they're going to want to know what the fire is going to be doing. And of course, what the fire is going to be doing is dictated by the weather. Agency administrators are taking the 30,000 view look at things. When is this fire going to go out? What could I look for in terms of a week to week forecast, thinking of when might we have some more favorable conditions so I can start to think about getting rid of this incident management team. We cost at, when we're running full capacity, we cost about a million dollars a day. So it's very, very expensive. So again, just a different audience. And then of course, there's the public. And I'm forced to give public meetings all the time or briefings during our public meetings all the time. And the public's interested not in, hey, is there gonna be an upslope wind on the Southwest aspect? Like I would talk to an operational resource. They're looking at bigger picture. Where are we in terms of drought? What are our fuels look like? Uh, what are the, the critical weather conditions that we're going to be seeing over the next 72 hours? Do I need to prepare my home to evacuate? Do I need to have everything ready to go? And so as a meteorologist, you're thinking about all of these different user groups. And at the morning, at the, well, you're kind of constantly evolving your forecast throughout the day. But during the morning, you're, you're building the forecast in your head. But while you're building the forecast process, you're also trying to look around and think about all of the different user groups that are gonna look at the products that you're producing and utilize that information to, to make actionable decisions. And I think that's really the critical part that uh, the incident meteorologist uh, brings to the table. So in terms of what I do when I'm on a wildland fire, I uh, generally I get up about 4.45 in the morning. Um, I start by making a pot of coffee. That's key. If I don't have, power or electricity, I have a converter in my truck and I will make it in there because that is the first thing. That's the most important thing, right? After that, I uh, do a deep dive into the forecasting stuff for about a half an hour. Generally, when you get wrapped into the, the, the process that is incident management, um, you're creating a day's forecast the night before. So in the morning when I wake up, I'll assess my forecast from the night before, ensure that it's still valid. At 5.30 in the morning, we have what's called an operations gaggle. Basically, I get with all of our operation folks and, um, excuse me, our operation leadership folks, and I just convey what I consider to be the problem of the day. What is gonna be the most important thing that we're gonna see on this fire today? And which area of the fire is it going to affect the most, which will affect the least? Because it changes depending on where you're at on the actual wildfire. That lasts about 20 minutes. Then I go grab another cup of coffee and at 0600, we have our operational briefing. And our operational briefing in the morning is, is the briefing that goes out to all of the folks on the fire. It includes all of the members of the incident management team and includes all the operational folks. Everybody will listen to the operational briefing. And an operational briefing used to look a lot like this. We have a map, some speakers. Um, these operational briefings would take about 20 minutes, maybe 25 minutes. And um, everybody would gather around and we would talk about all of our stuff. And all of the presenters, you would have one person from plans, one person from finance, from logistics, the safety officer, the liaison officer, the IMET, the FBAN, everybody would talk at these meetings. But you can tell this isn't from 2020, right? Here's another operational period briefing. Everybody's gathered around taking notes. The papers that they're holding 
are all the incident action plans. And this kind of lineup that you see right here is all the different speakers that are gonna be in the operational period briefing. And so it's, it's one of our two biggest briefings. The second biggest one would be our night operational briefing, which is pretty similar to this. We run two 12 hour shifts when we're on, um, a day operational period and a night operational period. However, I'm the only incident meteorologist on the fire. So it's kind of a 24 hour operational period. Um, some nights if there's thunderstorms, you just gotta suck it up and stay up really late and watch how thunderstorms progress through. But this year we had something special come through. So the presentation I had planned for April has changed <laughs> because this happened, right? So there's me at the East Canyon fire in Southwestern Colorado getting nose swabbed for the first time. Uh, yes, if you haven't had it done, it's interesting. It's a tickling sensation. Um, face coverings and social distancing are now required. How do you think that affected my ability to communicate with the resources that are on the fire. To say it fundamentally changed everything would be an understatement. Everything changed. Because when you can't communicate to somebody face to face, you lose a lot of what you're doing. And by the way, most of my conversations that I have on wildland fires that I feel like I'm doing the best job of conveying the information that I have is this right here. It's all informal briefings. It's me talking to firefighters and operational folks or having a conversation with our logistics section chief because I know that a thunderstorm gust front is going to hit us at 4 p.m. And if your tents and everything aren't staked down, everything's gonna blow away, right? It's those off the cuff conversations that are most important. And those are a lot of the things that we lost. And we lost them because instead of having everybody at an incident command post or an ICP, where everyone's together, we went to this model to keep everyone apart. And I'll talk more about that in just a second. So here's another picture of a day operations briefing. This is from the Weber wildfire back in 2012. This is in Mancus, Colorado, uh, Montezuma County. And um, this year we went back and we had the exact same facility for an incident command post for the East Canyon fire. Ironically enough, the Weber fire was on this mountain and East Canyon was right here and the East Canyon fire burned the next slope over. So it was neat, it was reminiscent, you know, I got to be like, oh, this was such a fun place to be six years ago or eight years ago, however long ago it was. But just look at how many people we had. This is inside the Montezuma County Fairgrounds, right? This was our day operational period briefing. So this is at 0600 in the morning. I went back there this year to the East Canyon Fire, same place, same organization, type two incident management team. This is what it became. All of our resources were spread out. Nobody was housed up in the same area. And what we ended up doing was having a much smaller subset of people present information. This is actually our fire behavior analyst talking, Al Stover, um, different fire behavior analyst. Um, we spread everybody out. We had people, I would call it dispersed camping. Um, our hand crews, engine crews, everybody was kind of in different areas so that we weren't interacting on a face-to-face -face basis in the, in, in the time of a pandemic. But now instead of communicating face-to-face -face with people, I'm communicating over a faceless radio. One way you acknowledge how people understand your information is you look for head nods or smiling or laughing if you tell a stupid joke, uh, all my jokes are stupid. Um, but you don't get that over a radio. Heck, you don't even know if people are hearing you. I mean, they could still be sleeping in. You're just assuming that everyone's listening in on your radio briefing and you know, completely understanding everything that you're saying. And so for me, it made me rethink a lot of things in terms of how I'm delivering information as an incident meteorologist. Other ways we did it. This is a public meeting, East Canyon Wildfire. Doesn't look like there's a lot of public there. Um, these are our two incident commanders. This is our incident commander, Mike Hayden. He's a fish and wildlife service guy. Um, this is Jared Hone, our deputy incident commander. He's actually the assistant fire management officer out here in the Black Hills. He's based on Custer. I can't remember who this guy is. And this is one of our operations section chiefs. And um, I had just gotten done giving uh, my briefing, but we were doing this over Facebook Live, like we're doing now. And so you don't necessarily get the acknowledgement that you want from the audience. If I'm giving a presentation to the public, I wanna ensure that the public knows that 
our incident management team is doing the best work we possibly can to ensure the safety and health of their community. However, the only acknowledgement I got back was, great job, the weather briefing was fantastic. Put Al Roker to shame. I was pretty happy with that one. And so I only have about another hour, maybe an hour and a half left, but a kid, I have like three slides left, it's cool. But this was the Cameron Peak fire. So down right here is Fort Collins. We were actually based out of Laporte, which is just north of Fort Collins. And this is the Poudre River that goes all the way up. Down here, this is Estes Park. This is basically Rocky Mountain National Park in this area. And our fire was buried up in the high country of Colorado, absolutely buried. Um, we have one of our operations section chiefs, his name's uh, Colby Crawford. He works out of here in South Dakota, but he's got like this Southern accent. I don't know why he's got it, but we were up there in the white areas. So this is a satellite imagery. So these white areas are, are basically mountain tundra areas above tree line, right? And Cameron Pass actually runs right through here. And then the town of Walden, Colorado and North Park is back over here. And we were sitting right about here, 10,800 feet. And Colby was asking me, he's like, Darren, what are the winds going to be doing? Well, he's like, Darren, what are the winds going to be doing? I don't, can't do his accent. Because the winds were funneling all through here. By the way, the headwaters for the Colorado River are right here. This is the Laramie River headwaters, Poudre River headwaters. I mean, it's the gnarliest train you can think of, right? And we're sitting right here, and he's trying to think about doing a, um, a burnout operation in this area because we didn't want this fire to squeak back through the pass to get on the western side of the divide to come down towards North Park. And I, I looked at him and I said, Colby, I, I don't know. I can't tell you what the winds are gonna be doing because it's too unpredictable because we're at too high of an elevation with too many intersecting drainages. I don't know what that's going to be. And again, in my opinion, to me, that's actionable information. Even though I can't give a consistent wind speed or wind direction, just the fact is that it could be from any direction at any speed at any time makes your operational decisions different because you're not basing your actions upon a certain wind direction. And Colby sat back after I told him this and he goes, yeah, these terrain features are pretty impressive. And I was just like, dude, it's 6,000 feet in elevation up here, 12,500 feet up here. Yeah, they're impressive. But he said it in the most just, oh, whatever tune. But when we got to Cameron Peak, it was relatively small. Um, I think this was like day five when we were there, maybe 25,000 acres. It burnt to over 200,000 acres after. This is the final perimeter of the fire. So it burnt almost all the way to Fort Collins. Um, some huge wind events took over in September. So what does the future hold for incident, meteorology, incident meteorologists within incident management teams? I think if we still continue with this idea that we're gonna have dispersed camps. Oh, and the one thing I wanna bring, bring up to you on this fire, our incident command post was in Laporte, but we had firefighting resources camped out all along the Poudre River all the way up. It took me an hour and 40 minutes to drive from here to here. And we didn't have communications. When we first got there, there's no radio contact, there's no cell contact, you just can't talk to people in here. But there's one volunteer fire station, right, it's right in here somewhere. And myself and our fire behavior analyst would drive up and down the fire every day. And on our way back down, we would give our night briefing via video. We'd record a video at the fire station. And so all the night operations folks could watch the video instead of us giving them a live presentation. It was just kind of one of those other things that we did to ensure that we were communicating the information there. So I think if this model continues in the future, if we have kind of dispersed camping where there are many firefighters in smaller groups over a larger geographical area, I think we're going to have to start really thinking about bringing in another IMET on fires, another incident meteorologist. There's, there's too many meetings and there's, there's too many people that you need to communicate with effectively that you just can't do with just one person. Um, we're going to continue our reliance on NWP, which is numerical weather prediction, and coupled fire weather modeling. I think coupled, weather, coupled fire weather modeling is the wave of the future. Basically takes a fire behavior model, overlays a weather model onto it, and you can watch how a fire is going to grow under different atmospheric conditions. But finally, I think the most important thing is going to be in decision support. And that's, that's where I, I'm confident meteorology is going in general, and it's really going 
in incident meteorology is just the fact that we have to be effective communicators. That's going to be the role of the IMAT of the future. We have computer, we have programmed ourselves out of forecasting jobs, right? We can't think and, and compute things that supercomputers are going to be able to compute in terms of what the forecast is going to be. But we still need to convey that into actionable terms for our audiences. So with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. That's all I have for you guys today. I've got one for you. Oh, that has one. Go ahead. Go ahead, Chris. So the question was, do you think in the future, maybe this coming fire season, we might have multiple incident management teams working the same fire? In short, no, because we don't have enough incident management teams as it currently exists to manage the fires we already have. We were at capacity this year. We were at capacity last year. When I say at capacity, the US can muster up 33,000 firefighters at most, something like that. We're capped out this year. So there's just, there's just no more bodies around. Um, there might be a few extra incident meteorologists around to add, or you might be able to find people to add here and there, but no, you, you wouldn't be able to find enough teams, especially at the peak of fire season. Great question. Yeah. Larger complex fires with fewer firefighters. There are less people that are willing to do the work. There are less people that are able to do the work because basically this, this work that we do as incident management teams is, is a side job. Everybody else on that IMT has a home unit and a home job, right? I'm the state fire meteorologist for South Dakota. I was in Colorado for four weeks this year, right? What am I doing in Colorado? Well, you kind of have to help out in order to make it work. So it's, it's kind of a combination of all of those factors. Um, unfortunately, from everything that I've read, seen, and studied, there's less volunteerism as well right now. And so there's just fewer people that are willing to take these fire assignments. And you can ask Jenny, it's tough when I leave. It's really hard. We got, we got, I got a two and a half year old at home. It's just, it's tough to just pick up and go. Um, so I think it's a combination of a, several factors. Yeah. Question was, is there any kind of risk assessment that I give in terms of percentages? That's something we call probabilistic forecasting. And so, yes, absolutely. Um, for instance, I don't wanna to get too deep in the weeds on this one, but if I have sunny skies on, any, on a given day, my odds of having higher winds are higher, right? But if I have any kind of cloud cover that surprises me, my wind speeds are likely going to be less. And so when I give a forecast, I give a component, I just call it my uncertainty section. There are days when I'm exceptionally confident in my forecast. There are days when I don't have any confidence at all. Not because of my ability to forecast, that sounds arrogant, but not because of the ability to forecast, but there are some things that there's still chaos in the atmosphere. There are still some things that we just can't adequately capture. And so, yes, we do try to give probabilistic information in terms of, I think there's a 75% chance of scenario A happening in terms of the forecast and a 25% chance of scenario B happening. And I do think that's good information because again, it goes into the fact that when you have folks out there that are trying to make decisions, they need to know if decision A doesn't work or we can't do it, we're gonna to go to decision B, decision C, decision D. Like there's, there's always something that you can, you, on even the hottest, driest, windiest day, there's always somewhere on the fire that you can do work on, right? And so there's opportunity to do work even if plan A fails. Does that answer your question? Good. Yeah, and that's one thing that I really push. Um, I'm on a few different committees across the country that talk about how we can improve forecasts. And it's one of the things that I, I really try to push is this idea of saying, hey, 
just telling people that we're gonna see an 85 degree day with 25% relative humidity and 15 mile per hour wind, that's not a good forecast. Because what if the firefighter gets out into the field and they're, and, and they're taking weather observations? What happens if their weather observations aren't supported by the forecast or they're, what happens then? Like, do they just throw the forecast out and make guesses the rest of their day? So we're trying to provide them with the information to make actionable decisions. Great question. That's a really hard one to, to characterize. So I have a question for you. Sure. What came first, you as state fire meteorologist or you as incident meteorologist? All came at the same time. So yeah, as of January 4th, I've been doing this 11 years. And when I came on, um, so basically how an incident meteorologist works is your, I'll call it sponsoring agency, can dictate what your qualification is. The state of South Dakota has basically qualified me as an incident meteorologist when I, when I took this job as state fire meteorologist. Um, most incident meteorologists actually work for the National Weather Service. There's roughly 80 of them. Um, they're qualified by the National Weather Service as incident meteorologists. Uh, there are a couple other state meteorologists. There's one in Washington, Minnesota, Kansas have a few of them. There's a couple of folks that work for the Bureau of Land Management that are incident meteorologists and their individual agencies qualify them as an IMET. Yeah, so it was all at the same time. So how do you go about becoming a state fire meteorologist? Well, <laughs> find a state that has a position that's open. Um, there's not a lot of states that have people that resemble what I do. Um, Florida does, Georgia does, California. Florida and California are kind of half times. Washington does, yeah, Minnesota does. Um, that's about it. There's probably six states, five or six states that have folks that are like state fire meteorologists. There are a lot of states out there now that are hiring meteorologists into their office of emergency management. Um, for instance, New York, I think, has seven, eight, nine meteorologists that actually work in their office of OEM. Florida has a bunch. Florida actually has a bunch in agriculture, too. Um, so there are other state meteorologists out there. And I'm actually working with the um, a American Association of State Climatologists to try to see if we can have a subgroup within that organization that's an organization of state meteorologists because I don't know, and I'm really curious to capture how many state meteorologists are, are out there, whether it's working for a Department of Ag or an Office of Emergency Management or anything else, because I just don't know, and we don't have our own kind of professional networking organization. So it's another thing I'm trying to do. Actually, our state climatologist, Laura Edwards, has been very helpful in trying to progress that forward too. So. I have a question that came in online. Sure. Uh, roughly speaking, how does the Black Hills National Forest do in terms of thinning trees in the hills to minimize fire damage? Uh, this person says, I realize limited resources prevent 100%, but percentage wise, how would you say they do in thinning areas to the level that it should be to properly manage the Black Hills National Forest? I can't remember the exact statistics or the wording used, but we have one of the most managed national forests in the entire United States. We kick out more board feet of lumber than anybody else, and we have 1.2 million acres. Our national forest does a heck of a job managing um, the Black Hills. They really do. Uh, the one thing I'm always an advocate for, however, is not only logging and thinning, but is the implementation of prescribed fire. Um, go back three years at this time, three years ago, the Legion Lake fire was burning through Custer State Park, 54,000 acres. And we had a couple of prescribed burn units. I can't remember, was it the Apple Tree RX? The Apple Tree RX was like a 450 acre prescribed fire in the middle of where the Legion Lake burned and we had burned it the year or two years prior to it. And I tell you what, that fire stopped cold when it hit the perimeter of the Apple Tree RX. Stopped it cold, burnt around it, but it didn't burn through it. And I think that was just a, a great kind of poster child to what the, the good things that prescribed fire can do on the landscape. And there's just not enough fire in the hills as it is. I mean, we've really managed the forest um, without fire, which is 
fine and dandy. I'm not here to tell people how to manage things, but you know, fire is a natural part of a forest just like trees are. And so I think, I think the Forest Service does a heck of a job uh, in terms of logging and thinning and, and getting woody debris out of the forest or woody material out of the forest. They leave a lot of debris. Um, but I think we could do a better job of prescribed fire, but prescribed fire is expensive. So yeah, question back here. Yeah, so the question was, um, from my perspective, how, how, do, how many people are actually taking care of their own private residences and private structures um, when they live in what's called the wildland urban interface? And I think some do a great job. I think some don't. You know, most of the, it's a scale, right? It's a sliding scale. Like if I was gonna build a house in the Black Hills, I wouldn't have Rocky Mountain Juniper as an ornament next, you know, like growing around my house. But you see that everywhere. Um, you see that absolutely everywhere. So, you know, personal responsibility is kind of one of these foundational things of being an American. And I think if people are gonna live in those ecosystems, um, they have to take some personal responsibility to, to, to prep their structures, to prep their land, to ensure that you know, they're doing what they can so that fire won't impact their structures because that's constantly on our brains in terms of incident management is you know, resource protection or structure protection. What can we do to better provide structure protection? Well, I'm getting on a soapbox here, but you have, you know, let's say Cameron Peak Fire when I was out there, let's just say there was 700 firefighters there a lot of those firefighters are 18 to 24 making 12 bucks an hour to save your house. Like where's the personal responsibility in that? And so I just, I, it, it, it really, it, it drives me nuts because I see it everywhere. And you know, it, it, you know, if you live in a floodplain, you have to have flood insurance, right? If you live in a hurricane area, you have to have, you have to build your home to, to a certain standard that includes hurricane clips and everything else it's like we can engineer we can we can literally we can engineer our way out of you know a fire like Cameron Peak which burned down roughly 500 stru structures we can do it I was on a fire I can't remember the fire now East Peak fire and um we were driving up after it burned 13,000 acres or whatnot and I remember one house that had a metal roof and stucco walls it was the only house left standing for this little subdivision of 12 homes like it's not complicated. We can do it. So I think, yeah, personal responsibility definitely comes into play, but I'm also starting to understand that more and more insurance companies are looking at the same things. And so, you know, there might be some external forces that go into it as well. Tough question. <laughs> Amanda. That's an interesting question. So the question was, um, in Australia, they have kind of a, a stand your ground training where, where homeowners are, are, are taught how to kind of fight fire and prep their own homes during an actual uh, incident. You know, that would take a fundamental shift in everything that we do in this country. It really would, especially when it comes to fire. And, you know, I know there's other countries that do the same kind of thing for structure fires, um, but it would, it would be a, a fundamental shift kind of from what we do now into something more like that. You know, and I think the biggest thing right now, what we can do is, is advocate for prescribed fire, bring people out to prescribed fire, let them, it, it, you know, yeah, prescribed fire is wildfire, it's on the ground, but you know, if you're, if you're back a ways in a safe area, like there's no reason it should be a festival. Prescri prescribed fires are awesome, right? It should be a wonderful thing that we're doing this thing. We're bringing fire back into the ecosystem. And I think if we start to change the public's mentality for maybe that, side of things, maybe it would go more in that direction. Yeah, I, prescribed fire means awesome. It's good stuff. <laughs> no. <laughs> they voted already? Uh, 
Well, again, I appreciate your time and thanks for coming and we can hang out for a little bit and finish our beers and whatnot. So thanks. Thank you, Darren. I think, yeah, I think Angela's got a couple of closing comments here. Sorry. Just really quick. Again, I want to thank everyone for coming also uh, and tell you really briefly about next month's presenter. So next month, uh, Steam Cafe is on January 19th. And our guest speaker is Gina Gibson, who is a professor of graphic design from Black Hill State. She is also the coordinator of the Artist in Residence program at the Sanford Underground uh, National Laboratory in Lead. And so she's the first person to be the Artist in Residence at SURF. And she's going to talk about her experience doing that, what inspired her, bring some of her artwork. Uh, so if you're available on January 19th, please join us for that. And again, thank you for coming.